episode number 171 with Stephen Mike. Welcome to the Heads of Poker Podcast. This is Steve Barton. This is Mike Snyderman. Mike Snyderman. How the hell are you, man? It's been a while. Hold on one second, Steve. Okay. I have to wipe, I wipe a tear away from my eye. <laughs> I missed you. <laughs> Were you expecting all, to have to all, bail me out of a Chinese prison or what? <laughs> we've all missed you. Oh, I am back. <laughs> back. Uh, I didn't know. I didn't think any Chinese person, but I could see you standing on the Great Wall, yeah. looking up, looking about, thinking about human achievement, and you'd be like, "Why exactly am I doing a poker podcast again?" <laughs> you would have some new adventure that would require one hundred percent dedication on your part. It was, uh, yeah, it was. It was a good. It was a good trip. It was a real time for me of like self reflection and uh, you know to just kind of check out for a month and a half. And uh, Steve, you were drinking and chasing pussy. Can you that, can you stop this? Can you well, stop this shit? Yeah, that's <laughs> that was about eighty percent of it. Yes. <laughs> oh, okay. Tell me. Tell tell us about the self reflection part because that's that's the part we really want to know about. You know, it uh, the biggest one for me was. Um, the uh, the divorce actually I I I had a lot of like unresolved issues from that and my buddy helped me a lot through that he um, he he's married and I got to see his interaction kind of like with his wife from an outsider looking in and it it was like you know he'd give her he'd give her a call every few days and and he'd be like hey you know we're going into the jungle and you know there may not be any wi-fi reception i may not be able to call you for a little while and you know she she'd be like oh it's all good you know have fun be safe enjoy yourself call me when you can i'm like so that's what it's supposed to be like <laughs> you know all i would ever hear every time i called my ex would just be you know she'd be pissed and uh you know you need to come home early and, and all of this. And, and it, uh, you know, so it was good for me to see that. And then another big like aha moment was that, and my buddy helped me realize this was that, you know, the divorce was basically, well, maybe it was both of our faults, but a big part of it was mine because I knew going in, it was a mistake. I knew getting married before I did was a mistake. And so that was kind of a tough pill to swallow because, I obviously did it anyways, <laughs> and uh, so kind of taking responsibility for that instead of just placing the blame on her was uh, was a big one. But it um, you know af- after this trip, I realized that you know there is a there is a light at the end of the tunnel, and it um, you know I'm not afraid to you know get into another relationship again anymore, and it was. Uh, it was a lot of fun. It was it was it was really good for me. It was really good. But it feels good to be back too. Man, sleeping in my own bed and not in a hotel. You know, right? It, of course, yeah. Waking up in the middle of the night and turning over in bed and running into a wall and like, wait, where the hell am I? <laughs> it, uh, it was uh, it was good. It was good. I, well, we knew you'd have a good time, Steve. I mean, yeah. you know, because you you have a good time anywhere. True. True. Yeah. Get, you you could get locked in a closet for like three months and be like, whoa. I bet this is the best closet within three blocks. You know what I mean? <laughs> you just you're just a glass half open kind of guy. Glass half filled kind of guy. Half full. I uh I also learned I love swimming. Uh okay. and I'm pretty good at it. It uh I I didn't realize it until um we went to an island like the last week and a half of our trip. And it's like bath water when you get into the ocean. And it was, uh, I injured my foot and so I couldn't go on my normal morning jog every day. And I thought, okay, well, swimming is probably a good, you know, substitute for that. So I got to where, um, every morning I would swim out to this rock, which was about, I don't know, two football fields away, which is, uh, like 200, 200 meters. And I'd swim out to the rock. I'd sit on the rock and I'd watch the, uh, 
watch the sunrise and then I'd swim back and then have breakfast and then at lunch I'd swim out again and then swim back and then for the sunset then I'd swim out and swim back again. And I thought, you know, I need to incorporate this into my, you know, morning routine when I get home. The problem is it's certainly not bath water here in uh, in Southern California. It is incredibly cold <laughs> and right. I, I really underestimated the cold factor um, when I did that. I, I, uh, I went out this morning and I swam in the ocean here. And it was brutal. It was. Yeah. It was no you need joke. a you need a you need a wetsuit to even think about it. I, I, think. Uh, I went out in a pair of board shorts, goggles, and earplugs, and nothing else. And uh, I lasted about maybe seven minutes, and it was so damn cold. And then you know there was no waves where I was swimming before. You know, so I, it was just like crystal clear water. You know, I mean, you could see. I don't care if it's a hundred feet deep; you could see all the way to the bottom. And out here, the visibility is about four to five inches. And there's a little bit of a, um, I mean, I know that my chances of getting eaten by a shark are probably less than getting hit by lightning, but there's something about not being able to see in the water and not sure. knowing how deep it is. And you can't see anything around you. That is, uh, it's a little scary. You know, I, I don't know what, like, I know it's a mental block in my head, but when I went out there and I was swimming, I'm like, holy shit, I can't even catch my breath because it's so cold. I've right. Instant headache. And I can't see anything around me. And I don't usually experience anxiety, but uh, that definitely brought it on. It's going to take me a while to get over well, that's that. Well, a, that's a compelling argument to stay out there, avoid the anxiety. Yeah, yeah. Aren't you, aren't you the kind of asshole, Steve? Let's be honest, that the shark wants to eat. <laughs> Like, like, just be like looking up, seeing a bunch of swimmers. Like, who's this guy smiling over there? <laughs> what is he so happy about? <laughs> is he listening to an inspirational speech while he swims? Yeah, uh, it was. Uh, that that's going to be a tough one. I think what I'll do is, is, as long as my foot's healing, I'll go out and swim. And then once it's healed, then I'll probably run, you know, four times a week, and maybe swim in the ocean two or three times a week. Because uh, to do that every day is just brutal. It was. I mean, there's so probably cool. a why. There's probably a why with a pool, but it's not the same sort of. You know, it doesn't have the same spiritual quality too. Is uh, it does feel uh, th thinking back to like eight years ago, last time I probably exercised on a regular basis. It is so good to start your day with some like rigorous exercise, though. It is, yeah. It. Uh, I chickened out yesterday, and I went to the pool that. Uh, it's not very close to my house, but I swam some laps there. And logically, I'm like, this, this makes absolutely no sense. I can literally walk to the beach from my house. It would take me about four minutes. Um, or I can drive 15 minutes to the pool, jump in and do some laps, and then drive 15 minutes home. But I got to pay five bucks every time, which Carlos would not approve of. Um, it's an extra 30 minutes of commuting that is completely unnecessary. And it goes against, uh, you know, I haven't taken a warm shower in over a year. I have the chili pad for my bed that I sleep at uh, the coldest setting. Like the cold ocean I know is good for me, but it's, I'm just scared of shit that I can't see in the ocean. <laughs> you know, it's like, I just got to get over that. It, uh, I guess it's good for me to get out there and swim it to get over that fear. But man, it it's... It's pretty, it's like really terrifying for me to get out there and not being able to see. And then especially I found when I couldn't touch, when I swam out far enough to where I couldn't touch and you don't know if it's seven feet deep or if it's 20, you can't see anything around you. It's, uh, yeah, it, it really is a fear that, uh, um, I need to conquer. Right. Yeah. I'm just I'm thinking of jokes for your eulogy, Steve. Sorry, I was I was spacing out there for a second. <laughs> he didn't have a lick of goddamn sense. <laughs> but we loved him anyways. Yeah. He swam out there knowing he was swimming to his death. <laughs> well, well, we got to get a few more uh, direct experiences from China here, I think, right? Tell us about the the Great Wall. I know you said you were going to go to. Did you did you do that or? I did. Yeah, I saw the Great Wall. It was uh, great. It was it was it was an experience. Uh, the guy that drove us there, he drives there. We hired a taxi to drive us there and back. Uh, where we we're staying was about an hour from it, and uh, and he he does it. You know, 
four or five times a week or whatever. Like that's basically his job is taking tourists to uh, the Great Wall. And the driver actually got out and he went to the Great Wall with us because he'd never been there when it was snowing before. Ah. And so that was kind of a neat experience. I built a little snowman on the uh, on the Great Wall and uh, took a bunch of pictures and stuff. It's it's impressive what they did. I mean, they built this wall. Um, there, there's many different sections of it. And the, the tourist part that you go to, you know, is one of the best sections of it. Um, there's towers probably every, I don't know, 200 yards. And they were watchtowers. You could see where they built the little fire to signal to the other uh, towers. Um, it uh, is impressive along like a cliff, like a ridge line. Um, it had to be, I don't know, 30, 40 feet tall uh, by probably 30 feet wide. Um, yeah, it was an impressive thing to see. That was really cool. Another thing we saw too was the uh, Terracotta Warriors. Yep. There was this uh, guy that uh, back in the day when the emperors, uh, you know, they had their army, whenever the emperor died, they would also bury alive a lot of his top generals thinking that when the emperor went to the afterlife, now he would have some of his top generals with him in the afterlife and they could, uh, they could go on and, you know, kick ass and take over the underworld. Uh, but what this guy did was, he wouldn't it, wouldn't that be a strong uh, motivation never to become a general? I, that's what oh, I no, thought. No, and I was no, asking no, our no, tour I'm, guide about I'm that. Happy, I'm happy being, uh, I'm happy being a sergeant. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I don't need to promote. I'm good. <laughs> but Jeez. she said okay. that they looked at it like a great honor because they also believed that they were going to take over the underworld with the with their emperor, but they had to get buried alive to do it. Um, but what was interesting about this guy was he didn't believe that he didn't want to have to kill his generals, so he uh, turned them all into uh, these clay soldiers. They were life sized. Uh, they were made out of clay. Each and every one was different, so they were modeled after uh, you know his his soldiers, and uh, and then he buried them all, and to keep it a secret so that there weren't any uh, you know looters or any any bandits any robbers that would dig them up and take the treasures. What he did was he'd have these artisans make these uh, clay soldiers from all around the uh, empire. And then whoever delivered the clay soldiers to the site so that he could bury them uh, were also buried alive. So they'd have a wagon full of these uh, soldiers. They'd deliver them to the site, and then they'd tell them, you know, go into this room over here so you can get paid. And then they would uh, close the door on them, and uh, they were buried alive. So there was over 10,000 people that were killed to keep, this, uh, to keep this, these terracotta warriors a secret. And they were. They didn't find them for, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years. Wow. Yeah, that's pretty. Yeah. That's pretty amazing. Right. Yeah. It was. Uh, it was impressive. So I got a couple little uh, clay uh, soldiers as a, um, um, I don't know, souvenir. So how yeah. how much of the country did you see? Would you say? I mean, you were you were traveling the whole time. Was there any spot where you just where you just say, hey, let's just stay, spend a week here. This is relaxing. Yeah. It, uh, we went through China. I was kind of anxious to get out of China because it, um, um, we spent about two weeks there. So we knocked off one of the wonders of the world and then we went through and did a bunch of hiking and stuff like that. So, which was really cool. Uh, but it, uh, the, the culture there, um, is very, very conservative. And, um, I, I was kind of, when, when we left China, I was, I was excited to go to a different country because, um, the girls there are very, very conservative. So if you're going to establish any kind of relationship, you need to be around for a while before <laughs> anything's going relationship, to Relationship, quotation marks. Steve, okay, <laughs> yeah, we, 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 we're, we figured this out here. <laughs> don't, don't, don't reveal too much of your, your empty, putrid soul here. No. <laughs> um. So where where did you leave, where did you go after China? I went to Laos. Um, it's a country that borders uh, Cambodia and Thailand and Vietnam, and, uh, and that was a lot of fun. Um, it was uh, first time. Is that your first time there? I know you, you've been to, you've been to Thailand before, I think. 
Yeah, I've been to Thailand uh, five. Uh, this was the fifth time I went to Thailand on this trip, uh, but I'd never been to Laos, and it was uh, yeah, it was very cheap. Um, it was a little bit um, uh, less conservative, <laughs> and uh, so that was fun. Um, we did uh, when you say a little bit less conservative, that means you had you had what seven, eight? How many women did you have sex with in two weeks there? Uh, maybe three, something like that. Jesus. And, uh, yeah. For, first of all, my, my favorite line from you on this podcast, I think, was you know the one where we're talking about the pickup stuff. I'm like, Steve, okay, first bit of advice. Wh- how do I get more women? And you're like, well, you got to go to Thailand. <laughs> <laughs> like, there's some strange village there of co- of of brainwashed women that'll just love me, you know. <laughs> um. Okay, I don't know. Sorry, Steve. I, I, once again, I've interrupted your your lovely story for a well, it was, uh, Yeah, it was cool. It um, uh, we went to this uh, one area in Thailand. It's called a Thousand Islands or Four Thousand Islands, and basically what it is at the Mekong River. It's kind of uh, Asia's uh, Amazon River. So it's this huge river um, that just I don't know how many metric tons of water it moves a second, but um, it giant river and then it kind of goes out into this floodplain and there's little islands that are kind of created from this you know there's um one of them that we stayed on um you could uh, ride a motorbike around it in probably an hour and then there was another one right next to it and uh so we rented some motorbikes and we cruised the islands and just went on boat trips and um uh, swam and uh it was a lot of fun I did. I did uh, injure myself though. I was going down a hill on a motorbike that I rented for four dollars a day or whatever it was, and that I rode a motorcycle for about a year. Um, I had a couple of motorcycles, and I'm used to having like two hand brakes um, on the handlebars, and the left one is for the back brake, and the right one is for the front brake. And I was going down a hill, and when you're going down a hill on a motorcycle, you don't want to push too hard on the front brake or you'll just go ass over tea kettle and you'll go over the handlebars, you know? And so as I was going down the hill, I go to grab the left hand brake and I realize that there isn't one. The back brake is controlled by a, a, a foot brake on your foot, you know? And so I kind of panicked and then I grabbed the other hand brake, which was the front one. And I started to go over the handlebars, and when I did, my foot got caught in the uh, in between the foot peg and the uh, and the gear shifter, and just I think I tore a muscle in uh, on my calf when I did that. And so for the next several days, I was sitting in a hammock drinking a beer with ice on my foot, and then after that, I got into uh, got into swimming to do some kind of exercise. But um, it was uh, Lao was a lot of fun, and then after that, we went to Thailand. And it took us two days to get from Laos to Thailand between buses and planes and boats and uh, to where we we're going. It was a little island um, off the west coast of uh, Thailand called Koh Li Phi. And, you know, like I said, it was beautiful. I mean, the snorkeling was unbelievable. Um, it was like bath water. It was just a little paradise. So we got stuck there. I think we stayed there eight or nine days or something like that. And the only reason we left was because we had to fly home. Right. Yeah. Is that is that where it was that the most idyllic place for uh talking chasing women? It was pretty sweet, yeah. Okay. <laughs> it was pretty cool. Steve, let's go back to some PUA. Just give us of one of the women you hooked for um this is your big edge is just confidence uh not, no not to break down all the PUA stuff, but like most guys can like if they get drunk in a bar can like summon the courage to talk to women. But you can you can do it anywhere, right, Steve? You like you're just uh, looking for directions, or is this just give us one of the women you met in Thailand and how it? You don't have to give us the details of of, of once you rip her bra off with your teeth. <laughs> just, just 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 leading up to that, can you the, the the chick you thought was the cutest? You're like, ah, I wish, you know, I wish she lived in Southern California. Okay, here here's what I do: is anytime I'm attracted to one, I just initiate somehow some type of conversation. So like this girl, there was a gym that was close to where we were staying on, on our bungalows. So I went down to the gym in the morning and I saw a girl there and, uh, you know, I just said hello and we started talking and then I told her, I said, Hey, uh, you know, what are you doing today? All right, I think she asked me what I was doing today. 
And I told her, I'm going to go down to this, this one beach, you know, you should come down and, and, you know, we'll have a drink or something. She never showed up, but that night I saw her at a bar and she was all dolled up. And, uh, and so I went over and talked to her and, and, you know, kind of went from there. And I found out later on, like a day or two later, that she actually got dolled up for me and she went out to the bar hoping to see me there. So wow. <laughs> that was kind of cool. So we hung out for the next few days and then, then I had to leave. Um, but like she was, she, she was a, she was a Thai girl. Yeah. She was local Thai girl. Yeah. Um, How, how's her, how, how's the English? What, which, which of those countries is most, uh, where is your lack of your lack of uh, foreign language uh, uh, the least impediment to uh, you know talking uh, to women? Definitely Thailand. It definitely was Thailand. a little bit in Lao and China was just you were on Google Translate every single time. You know you could get through Ni Hao saying hello and then I could count to ten, but that was about it. <laughs> so every time we wanted to go somewhere, we got on Google Translate and you know had to show the cab driver where it was, and it was uh, it was pretty challenging. That was, that so was, how do you say how do, how do you say rub and tug in Chinese now? I'm sure you know. <laughs> you say special, and they understand. That's that right. Okay. Yes. <laughs> you um, want special. I haven't yeah. noticed. Have you posted any pics on uh, on Twitter or Facebook, Instagram? Uh, you know what? I threw up some pictures on Twitter. I think like a week and a half in, and then that was about it. I was pretty much MIA the uh, the whole time. Okay. Well. Yeah. I'm sure people would like if you threw a few, threw a few more picks up on Twitter there. Yes, I will. Go ahead and check uh, check check my Twitter uh, before this uh, comes out. I'll throw some uh, some picks up at H U P podcast. So, Steve, somebody gives you a billion dollars. It sounds like if you, you're you're going to have three homes on this planet. It sounds to me like one of them might be on a little island in Thailand. This is one of your favorite places, right? It is. Yeah, I. Uh... I found out something this trip too. I talked to some of the business owners in Thailand, you know, that own a restaurant or bar or a hotel or whatever. And they, um, I originally thought to own property in Thailand, you had to marry a Thai person. And they said, no, that's not true. Uh, you can, you, you know, just to get a little spot on the beach though, it's probably going to cost you a million bucks. I'm like, okay, well, at least it's possible. And then I found out what they do is they lease the land and they sign up leases. They, you know, get a lawyer and they write up a lease for, they call it a 10 plus 10. So you negotiate a lease that doesn't go up or down for 10 years. And then another one after that for another 10 years. And you can even do a 10 plus 10 plus 10 for 30 years, depending on how long you think you're going to live. And he said, what you do is you open up a business you put it in your name and you can just call it, you know, Steve's bungalows or Steve's restaurant or whatever. And uh, you physically own the business on that land and you negotiate a lease that for as long as you want. So that was pretty cool. Um, so what I'm envisioning is a house on the beach so I can go out and swim every day and do my spear fishing and snorkeling and stuff. And then probably have a few bungalows there that, uh, you know, when friends or relatives come by and, and want to visit, they can stay. And when they're not there and I want to make a little extra money, I can, I can rent them out. Um, and people in these countries are very open to foreigners coming out and doing that because the way they look at it is you're creating, you know, for every white guy that goes into uh, these countries, he's probably creating three jobs because you need somebody to build your house. You need somebody to, uh, sure. you know, maintain it and, Bringing, bringing capital exactly yeah. and other and other tourists and capital follows of course too if you know if you get a couple nice restaurants there and a few more extra tourists will be swinging through exactly so that was and the locals neat. the locals i think it's very similar to the cook islands the way my buddy was describing it, i think too with we, you can't really buy the land as much as lease it so the, the locals do maintain some control yeah. so it's just like rich white guys coming in and just buying the country off yeah yeah They're, they maintain control of it but you also get the advantages of, yeah, foreign money. Yeah, exactly, exactly. But it, um, yeah, it was uh, it was fun. How, how about you? You've you've had a, a hell of a run in the last uh, six weeks online, huh? I had a good uh, yeah. My best uh, one of my best ever months in April. I had a pretty sick heater where I final tabled a million dollar ACR tournament, and then um, 
you know, final table, the couple hundred Ks and one a 50 K and a 40 K. And yeah, I don't know, probably up 50 or 60 K over the month. Thank God. Right on. Good for you, man. Good for you. So, you know, I had five or six straight losing months. So, uh, yeah, desperately needed for yeah. sure. Good. Good. You sound better. than. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, still, um, Maybe I'll maybe I'll get into it at the same time we discuss your your wife trying to kill you. But uh, yeah, I, I have some pretty intense personal stuff going on that keeps my keeps me from getting too feeling too much joy at this point. You know, I still just haven't quite figured out the. I have to become a good live cash player just to, if I want to just live a decent life here and not be constantly on the edge. Um, so yeah, I had the nice heater. And then I stopped really playing much online for the last three weeks. ACRs have been having all sorts of problems. Oh, really? God only knows what. They keep breaking down tournaments. They keep getting hacked. I did get all my money off, so I'm happy with that. Okay. But I pretty much just stopped playing there. Like this past Sunday, I looked at the schedule. Like all they had was a 50K. Hmm. Like usually they got an 80K and 100K and 150K. And for a while there, their schedule was just beautiful where they had a million dollar tournament each week with like four or five hundred Ks. Um, so that stopped and I'm, I'm now boycotting ignition until they get me some money. They owe me $2,100, which was supposed to be taken off via Bitcoin. And I've shown them the blockchain that it did not transaction did not go through, but the money's not back in my account. Hmm. So I've been fighting with them for like seven weeks. And the funny thing is, Steve, I think we've had this discussion. Usually if you say, um, I'm going to get on the internet and, you know, very social, socially media savvy and get you know, get all over on you, get, you know, expose this, they, they start acting quickly. So I did that last time. I said, um, I'm active in social media and you, you'll find this. I said, I have a podcast with over a million downloads <laughs> and don't, and all they said was, um, we're sorry you feel like this, but we're still investigating the matter. So, <laughs> so they don't give a shit. Well, <laughs> or, yes, I was, uh, next time I'll, I'll send a picture of a photograph of you holding your fist up. <laughs> Just angrily staring at the game. I know people. <laughs> yes. I'm a big deal. People know me. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I was getting all enthused for online again and getting, but, um, you know, I just can't deposit an ignition again right now. It feels feels stupid. And like I said, ACR has been having problems. And carbon is just such a, a uh, you just can't put in a really good volume there. So it's, you know, it's it's a dubious value. Yeah. Unless yeah. you're playing another site. What do, what do you think, Steve, about uh, the Supreme Court decision? I don't know if you saw that. I, I haven't. People have discussed it a little bit. I don't know the ins and outs. Where basically states cannot ban sports betting. Hmm. So a lot of people said, obviously we've been saying this for years. Why, why is there DraftKings, which is, you know, especially with pro football and everything – sports betting is just so much bigger than poker in terms of money thrown in terms of, you know, people losing money and, uh, but that's legal. And now it's, I guess the government can't really regulate it. I don't know at all. I, I mean, I don't, I don't know the specifics of the rule, but it's like, this has got to be good for poker, right? This is what a lot of people are saying. I would think so. It, uh, I've, I've been out of the news now for six weeks, so this is the first I've uh, heard of it, but it yeah. is politics. Really, is all about money, though. So the, the the way I was thinking about it is, you don't have a lot of people with money standing in the way of the sports betting thing. Like everybody can make money on it. You're not other than illegal bookies. Nobody's toes are getting stepped on here. True. Kind of. But if you legalize online poker, then um, card rooms are getting hurt. They, uh, fight it pretty hard, you know, like the Indian casinos. And so a lot of financial interests are against online poker where the gambling, I'm not sure. I know like New Jersey was ecstatic, you know, now we can have a sports book and the, the Atlantic city casinos this is going to help us. And so the casinos aren't against it for sure, yeah. where the casinos are against the online gambling, which just shows you kind of a corrupt system here. If that's the determining factor. Yeah, yeah. Legally, poker to me should have the same standing now as, but uh, I don't know. I would think even more. I think poker is more of a skill game than, well, professional sports betting is too. But uh, yeah. Well, well, the daily drafts stuff is 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 skill. As as we've had a couple of guys, Lena Mark and James Gettinger, yeah. who are 
who, do it for who, a living. <laughs> I think make a good living on that. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. James was impressive. He had a, the last time I talked to him, he had a, uh, he had a guy in India. He basically wrote a program, uh, a software program to figure out who the winners are. <laughs> and, uh, and he has a kid in India that he pays five bucks an hour to, uh, to fill out these spreadsheets and, and gather the data for him. And then he analyzes it and picks his winners. <laughs> it's, uh, it's like, oh my God. This guy is going to be a multimillionaire. It, uh, it was a probably. Yeah, you know, you know, I um. So How about uh, uh, Vegas coming up, Steve? Uh, that's exactly what was on my list right here. <laughs> Plans for WSOP twenty eighteen. <laughs> when uh, I'm what does your list have? With this, What's uh, with the this weirdest thing run? on your list? Is it like dildo broken? <laughs> buy 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 milk. <laughs> Discuss Vegas with Mike. <laughs> yeah i don't know if i can go to vegas i think i'm gonna go for the first four or five days and play the online event and then play like a win daily i i, I don't know if the problem is if i'll go absolutely bonkers being now going there and knowing i'll be deprived of the rest of the summer but i was not kind of going to go at all and then carlos put his google spreadsheet up looking for investors mm-hmm. and he was telling me man you got to do it so I immediately, you know, had a manic fit and got him, did my Google spreadsheet and got it up and I was ready to post it on two plus two and Twitter and start looking for money when this little mini crisis emerged. So, um, I'm thinking I'm not going to be out there too much, hmm. almost certainly not for July, the main event. The question is, can I be there for like the first two weeks? Okay. In, in June. Yeah, the June. So basically, I could play the Colossus and the Millionaire Maker, and I, you know, maybe a, a couple of Venetian tournaments. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'd still like to do that. Um, but um, yeah. So that's all. So Steve, in, in, but you have you talked to Mike? Do you have housing uh, set up for Vegas? Or no, I didn't. Uh, actually, I'm going to put that on my list right now, along with buying milk. Um, yeah, I'm going to be out there June eighth through June 28th. So you can might as well write, don't bring dildo to Vegas. And then in parentheses, judgment. <laughs> sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry. What date, Steve? June 8th through June 28th. So, wow. If- I mean, Steve, I mean, I, the, your, your job is ridiculously good. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> I mean, you can, you can, can't you retire? When, when, I'm sorry. I, just when it, you were off for six weeks and then you get another four weeks. Like, yeah, well, this will be three weeks later. I got basically what I do is we're required Uh, to have 12 months worth of work, which irons out to about 120 something days. And I work those 120 something days in 10 months. Uh, so I do 12 months worth of work in 10 months and then I use the rest as vacation. And, uh, so that's obviously, obviously you and your, uh, all your fellow firemen are, are good at working this out. Who, who, who gets this month off that kind of thing. I'm sure other guys try to use the same. Oh yeah. When you look at my work calendar, it's just got colors all over it as, as I'm working for this guy this day and he's working for me that day. And, uh, I've, I've got a spreadsheet actually where I keep track of it all because they don't care who's at work. They just physically need a body there. You know, so um, it's really pretty sweet when you're figuring out your schedule, you know, because <laughs> you can you can essentially have any day off as long as you can find another guy to work it for you. But then you also got to work for him Memorial Day weekend and Christmas and <laughs> days like that, you know, but, uh, you know, what you a can... fucking racket. Sorry. <laughs> Did I, say that? I mean, it really it really is amazing. No, I mean, I, I know you work hard when you're there, but uh yeah, I'm just amazed. Six weeks off in a row is just amazing to me. And then just to come back for a few weeks and take another month off is – I'm sure you're grateful for that, I guess. is my. Opinion. It's one of the reasons that I chose this profession. I mean I really do love going on the calls and I love the excitement. I love the danger of it. I love you know, the adrenaline and all that. Uh, but the, the schedule is – Definitely number two right after yeah, that. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, well, well, once you're in that, I guess the post office, it, it took extraordinary circumstances for me to leave the post office, which is a pretty you know good job. Not quite, you, you can't get the time off that you get for the, for the fire, fire department. It's just not plausible. Yeah. But um, you can get a lot off. But um, 
Yeah, once you're in there, I'd be. I'm. A, I'm a, I doubt anyone who's a fireman says, "Hey, you know, I've always wanted to work at Home Depot. I'm going to go get my graduate degree in this." You know, once you're in, it's just such a good, uh, such a good job. Yeah, it takes forever to get hired. I mean, you know, there's thousands of people that put in applications for just a few jobs, but once you get, you know, you go to the schooling, you volunteer for right. years, and you finally get through that, and then once you get through your year of probation, um, after you get hired and check all the boxes, pass all your tests and all that, then you're pretty secu- pretty securely vested, you know. Um, and you just got to make sure you don't get hit by a car or fall through a roof and you can make it to right. the end of your career. Okay. June 8th through the 28th. What is your – I know um, <clears throat> you were once like discussing your bankrolls, which is down to like I'm bringing $2,123 to Vegas. <laughs> <laughs> You have things always marked out with the exact amount of money you're bringing out there. So do you? I assume you've done this again this time. A little I bit have, here. yeah. I took. Uh, I took. Uh, uh, I usually take fifty percent of my bankroll. And Hold I- on, let me let me think. Let me come up with a number here. Okay. Let's see. This will be good. Um, I'm guessing you're going to want to play play a lot of the dailies there. Yes. Right. Yep. Some cash. Um, I would say. If you ran horrible, I'm sure you're planning for this. Like, what's the worst I could do if worst I only case scenario, yes. if I only min cash every 12 tournaments and run bad? And geez, in your mind, what would you need? I'm gonna say eighty five hundred dollars. Fifty six. Fifty six hundred. Fifty six hundred. That's my. Uh, I'm gonna start out with the dailies. Uh, you know, if I final table. Uh, one of those or something, then I'll then I'll bump up and start playing some of the uh, bracelet events. But I think I'm just going to. I think the first few days I'll kind of get my feet wet and get used to uh, you know playing 12 hour sessions and stuff. Uh, I'll start out with the win dailies, um, whatever the first one is I play. Uh, Carlos is going to have one percent uh, of me for that, and then uh, after that I'm probably going to bounce around to the uh, maybe Venetians, um, some of the Bellagios, and then. You know, if I'm feeling froggy, then I'll jump into the uh, um, the 235 uh, daily deep stacks at the uh, at the Rio. Um, those 235s, though, I mean, there's so much value because I, I really believe that 30 to 40 percent of the people that buy into those things don't even have a chance of even cashing. You know, they have no idea how long the tournament lasts. Uh, they're not prepared for it. They, um, you know, they bought a lottery ticket and they basically ran it through the shredder. Uh, so I think there's a lot of value in those, but they are so top heavy. It's just like, you got to final table those things or you just can't, you know, show a profit in the long run and to go through 1500 people every single day is just exhausting, you know? So I, I think I'm going to take a little bit more of Carlos's approach this year and try to, you know, consistently buy into tournaments that have between 50 and 200 people. Cause, uh, it's just such a grind, you know, <laughs> you play for 15, 16 hours to get to the right. final table. It's like, man, you gotta take a look at the Binion schedule. Oh, I think, okay. uh, that's, you know, one of Carlos's favorite spots. And, uh, I don't know about the rake there, but they got actually pretty good structure. So you get the smaller fields plus the better structure. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I'll be in some of those, <clears throat> but, um, yeah, I need to get a hold of Mike and is, uh, Alex Venosa going out this year. Do you know? Uh, yes, okay. he's not going out till the second or third week of June. So, okay. um, but Mike's going to yeah. be there the whole get, get in touch or? with him. Yeah. I think Mike is, uh, I asked him about the first two weeks cause like a month or two ago, I told him I'm not going to Vegas. And I said, well, I'm going and And I asked if there's any room out there and I think they're kind of booked up the first, or at least I said I needed my own room. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, I can't do a couch or anything with my, I'm old and my bad back, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to need my own room too. I'm not, I'm not sleeping on the uh, the blow mattress anymore in the living room. <laughs> I can't woken up. Well, you got your brother's place too, though, right? I mean, I guess you you, you like hanging out. You want to hang out with poker players, but I do. Yeah, you, so you probably can you know organize that too. You know, KB is going to be here these days. Oh, let's hang out, do this. I mean, just as long as you know who's in town, people who listen to this podcast, I'm sure you could. There's always going to be people people there to interact with and go out and have a beer with and have lunch and talk poker with. Yeah. Yeah. I think my folks actually just bought a place out in Vegas. So they're going to be kind of snowbirds traveling from Idaho to uh, Vegas, uh, chasing the summer. 
Um, so I can stay with my brother. I can stay with uh, my folks. And my aunt actually just bought a uh, place in Vegas, too. So I have no shortage of uh, places to stay. Uh, but there is so much value that it's hard to even articulate in staying in a house of other poker players. And when you all get back, you just talk cards for, for hours and analyze hands. And it, uh, that's really what you're getting, you know, when you're staying in a place like that is that, Oh yeah. Just, just eavesdropping on a conversation between, uh, Alex and I mean, uh, Mike and Evan or any of those guys is, is, yeah. Yeah. Totally enlightening, you know, it, uh, so I definitely want to stay with them for at least a portion of that trip. Um, but, uh, yeah, I'm excited. Uh, it's going to be fun. <laughs> it's going to be fun. <laughs> yeah. I might have to miss out on Vegas, which sucks. Um, we'll see something might, if I go to Vegas, it's going to be, uh, certainly last minute planning, but, um, yeah, I, I, the, me showing up for the main event is less than 1% chance. I think so. Yeah, okay. Alas, what can you do? Yeah. yeah. Um, what else is going on? Bitcoin, Steve. We had, we, we had, when was the last time we had a show without talking about Bitcoin? Oh, sadly. Yeah. And, but it uh, is, it, it just dominate my days because the price of the price of that is totally, uh, I told myself on this trip, I'm not going to look at any cryptocurrency and that lasted about 45 minutes. And then I was just glued to uh, what the Bitcoin price was doing for the last six weeks, but I didn't look at any of my other altcoins. Uh, but I did follow uh, Bitcoin, Bit, Bitcoin Cash, and um, Ethereum and Litecoin, and there was a period there where it was going up, and it it almost made it to uh, ten grand, and I was like, "All right, we're going in the right direction." <laughs> and, uh, the, like the last week, it just went yep. down again. I'm like, "Oh man!" Yeah, I was getting excited. I got, of course, Steve. Every everything's a fuck up for me though, but. Um, when I had the score for twenty three thousand for final tabling the million dollar tournament, you know, immediately they sent me an email saying we need this this sort of verification before you get the money off. And I happened to be in vacation with my parents or over my parents uh, in uh, the East Coast. Mm-hmm. Like they wanted, I, I needed a new driver's license to show them and you know update some stuff. So when I won the tournament or. When I won the money, the I think I want to say Bitcoin was like fifty eight hundred or sixty. I can't remember. Mm-hmm. And I had some. I had about thirty thousand to take off. So I would have gotten like five and three quarters, five and a half Bitcoin if I could have taken it off right there. Yeah. But it turns out it took about three weeks for me to get the money off, and this oh. was like Bitcoin was up to ninety two hundred. Oh. So I got three. You know, basically I lost two Bitcoin there. It yeah. would have been if it if I could have just sucked it right off. Which sucks because, you know, if Bitcoin's going where we want it to go, then that's really like losing 50,000 this, just this year, hopefully. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So that's yeah. pretty uh, – that was pretty brutal. Um, I mean, obviously, I'm just happy to uh, get it off. I'm hoping my cash reserves are still like really low. So I, I still haven't had to sell Bitcoin Good. in the last since, – since this heater. Um. Even though my, you know, typical cash game not going good, or you know, I'm showing. I think on the year I'm making like eleven bucks an hour or something. Um, I think I can't even judge how good or bad I'm running. Like I did last night, I sat down and like within 15 minutes I got it all in with aces, mm-hmm. 250 bigs or whatever it was, and lost to ace king, oh, all in pre, all in pre flop. Oh god. Um. So I, I think I'm running bad, but I don't know. But anyways, back to the Bitcoin. Um. Yeah, at least at least I have it. You know what I mean. And it's just but it, it, to see it go back down to like under six a k would be like for you when it was crawling up till ten. I'm like, we're gonna get past ten and never look back. Yeah, that's what I thought. And uh, <laughs> it never it never made ten. And then like within a couple of days, it was back down to I think it might have even gone under eight k a little bit before firing back up over eight. Yeah, when it, the but, lowest I saw it at was eighty two. Um, and, but I don't know when I was sleeping, it could have gone down below that, but yeah, I was like, damn it. What the hell happened? I was even telling my buddy, I'm like, I am a genius. This all worked out. <laughs> I'm finally, uh, even from the last time I bought all this, uh, cryptocurrency and then the next day it like went down. I'm like, oh, damn it. Come on. Um, <laughs> yeah. Quickly. Interesting how you, uh, I was, I thought of you, this was a couple of weeks ago where I was sitting at a table with a guy 
And, you know, half the people are talking about crypto, you can tell, are just dreamers like me hoping it blows to the roof. But the sound, this, this one guy was talking about it and super smart guy talking very specifically about this blockchain and the technology and da, da, da. And people were talking about Warren Buffett that day because he's like, there's nothing you can do to stop it. It's going to grow. It's a good yeah. investment. But he was real high on Bitcoin cash. He's like, if you got money, this is where to go right now. Mm. Kind of like you said the same thing. First of all, obviously, we already know this. It just works a lot better than Bitcoin. It's faster. Yeah. yeah if you want to move it around. And so he was talking about, I don't know if they're improving their technology or a new block. He's just saying, you know, when there's a, a, a wider adoption and everyone's using this, it's going to be Bitcoin Cash. That's number one. It's going to, he says, it's going to leave Ethereum in the dust. Um, this is where you want the money. And he was, he was very, he's like, oh, Bitcoin's great too. That's going to go up. But he's like, Bitcoin Cash is going to be 7,000 by the end of the summer, over 10,000 by the end of the year. It's going to, it's going to outpace Bitcoin and everything else for the next few years. So cool. again, I am, Steve, I'm just, uh, you know, I'm, I, I just follow whoever the, the last person I talked to. <laughs> but I immediately um, sold most of my Ethereum. I didn't have a lot of Ethereum. I had like 10K or something. But uh, I sold it all and bought like, I think at the time, Bitcoin Cash was like 1500 or something. So I bought like seven, seven Bitcoin Cash. I don't know. We'll see how that, uh, how that goes. Don't follow my advice, people out there. But uh, like I said, this is a guy who didn't seem to have an axe to grind or wasn't just wanted to marvel at his own business sense for buying this coin, blah, blah, blah. He's, he's, he's somebody who'd studied the technology in the market and really thought was pretty – felt pretty strongly that Bitcoin Cash was the future. Okay, okay. I, I met a guy. I talked to him for about an hour and a half, two hours. And where was I? It's either Thailand or Laos. I can't remember. And he, he was into uh, day trading. The kind of trading where you you buy something and three to four minutes later you sell it and you know like that fast of trading. And I asked him about cryptocurrency and he's totally into that just as much as day trading. And his basic concept was he said, you know, you can make a lot of money in these cryptocurrencies, but he thought that over time the governments are going to start regulating it and it's going to go away. And I, I believe that it is the future and that this is going to be our currency, whether that's five years from now or 30 years from now. Um, and he believed that too, but he also believed that it's none of the cryptocurrencies that are out there right now because they just don't have the, the fast processing transactions like you can do with a Visa or MasterCard. He said when they can, when they can start doing 20, 30,000 transactions a second, that'll be the future. But there's no cryptocurrency out there right now that can do that. And I was like, okay, that kind of goes in line with what, what I think. And, um, you know, it was, it was interesting. Another thing he told me too, is he said that the IRS can track everything that you do on Coinbase. Right. And so he told me about another site. He said, it's better to move it. Um, whenever you're buying or selling, it'd be better to move it off of, uh, Coinbase onto this other site. And now that I've talked about it, I can't remember the name of the is site. G Dax, right? Or no? I don't know. No, it was. Uh, well, there's a bunch of them now up. But yeah. even those sites, like that's another issue I was having with the uh, America's Card Room. They wanted my wallet, a wallet, and I uh, so I opened a thing at Kraken, and Kraken wanted not just they wanted your social security number, your address, a photo, ID, blah blah blah. So they're going to have all the. Government's going to have all that information from there. I'm sure there's wallets that operate. Don't even ask for that information. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I think you got to pay Uncle Sam. I think you're taking too many uh, chances if you don't. I think so, too. I think um, so, too. Yeah, for the first time ever, I asked for an extension on my taxes, by the way. This is uh, – they're, A, they were confusing, and B, not, not that it was an excuse. You know, I went to uh, Florida to be with my dad, who's having some serious uh, health issues at the time. Yeah. So um, – but uh, yeah, I'm not looking forward to sitting down with the, doing the taxes and taking a look at uh, all the crypto stuff specifically. But yeah, yeah. I, I think the day trading is the way to uh, is the way to go, and then just just not be emotionally invested in this technology or this. You know, just with just take your money off when things are when it goes back, and then put it back up when you you have a good info on this coin or that coin. Yeah. But yeah. anyone who says who's doing like a technological study, well, these three are the coins of the future. You know what I mean? It's yeah. technology is always changing. 
there's so much competition out there. You know what I yeah. mean? Yeah. Yeah. It is fun though. I mean, like <laughs> there's been several times where I'm sitting down having lunch and I'm on my phone and I'm like, I've seen this pattern before with, uh, with ripple or with Tron. And I'm like, F it. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to sell right now. I think it's, I think it's about to drop and I do. And over the course of my meal, you know, I make a hundred dollars. I'm like, <laughs> that was awesome. <laughs> you, know, you feel like a genius when it works. <laughs> but, um, uh, the, uh, yeah. The, uh, uh, just speaking of the day trading, there's a guy who, um, he got in real late at the casino. He got in like late December, like bought Bitcoin. I forget like 25 or 30,000 when it was 25, they put like when it was uh, like 16 K. Oh boy. So I was talking to him. I'm like, thought he'd be, he's like, no, I'm up like 30,000. He just keeps buying and selling the coin. Uh, like okay. he just, he's like, I've got the rhythms down like you. I mean, I don't know if he's a uh, right. Well, this last time it went up to 10, he, he immediately sold everything. Wow. I don't know if he's got like four coin now or something. And uh, so he says he's up 20 or 25,000 the last, which is quite an accomplishment. Yeah, no shit, especially uh, in 16. Yeah, so he, um, like I said, so I'm like, well, I'm asking him, when are you when are you buying back in with the Bitcoin? He's like, I'm waiting until it goes down to 6,500 again. So I, I'm like, no, it's never going down there again. But if it does, <laughs> he's, he's made, he's made, he's done well. He's, yeah, he's, no kidding. He's turned his four Bitcoin into five and a half or whatever it is. Um, wow. So That's yeah, cool. there's there's always people making money on it, even when it ostensibly is not doing well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm gonna do a uh, before I go out to the WSOP. Uh, I'm gonna do a session with Alex Fitzgerald and uh, just have him look over my database and uh, see what uh, you know. I'm sure he'll spot four or five things that are glaringly obvious to him that are not to me that I need to work on uh, before I go out there. I figure, you know, I've got, a, you know, almost a hundred thousand hands on there that, uh, he should be able to gather some good Intel for me, uh, before I go out there that I can work on. And so I'm looking forward to that. I haven't had a, uh, coaching, coaching session with him before, but after watching all his videos on TPE and everything, I, he's, I think he's the, uh, he's the man to look over it for me. Absolutely. Yeah. That'll be fun. Um, well, do you, uh, do you have any interesting hands from uh, the other night? Uh, <laughs> no, I um, yeah, I played p- poker by the way last night again until like four thirty in the morning. Oh, had wow. a uh, had a very rough night. Um, but uh, I actually been logging a lot of my hands, Steve. Ah, I nice. think I told you that writing yes. so so Alex can look at them or whatever. So I found one from like uh, five weeks ago. Okay. I'm looking at it. It's not a super fascinating hand, but I just, um, like I said, sorry, Steve, I just didn't uh, didn't look th- too through these too long to see which was the interest most we- the weirdest hand. But I thought this one was kind of interesting. Okay. Uh, this is playing two five. Okay. Unfortunately, I can't play. I've done f- decent in the two five. I'm making like forty bucks an hour, which is about what I I would accept that. But oh, yeah, that's a lot right. of times I show up at like seven, I show up at like seven or 8 PM and that game breaks at like midnight. Okay. So then I have a decision. Do I want to play two, three or five, five? Yeah. And, uh, you know, the five, five is high variance. I had my best day ever at five, five about a week and a half ago. I made 7,600 or something in like three hours. Wow. Um, and then since then I'm down like 3000, you know, but, uh, uh, I wish I was better at poker, Steve. Anyways, this hands at two, five. I have about seven hundred dollars, and I don't have the suits here, so you're already going to get angry. But it's obviously <laughs> to the hand. But I raised the cutoff uh, to twenty dollars with Ace Queen off. Okay, twenty dollars in the cutoff, Ace Queen off. All right. The button who has about five hundred dollars. Uh, guy I'm friends with, very very tight. Um, he calls. Okay. The small blind. Um, who is this uh, older uh, Asian gentleman? I don't think I've ever played with him before. Um, I wish my memory was better. I see faces I know I've played with and can't remember stuff, you know. But um, he has about six hundred dollars in front of him, and he raises to sixty dollars. Okay. 
Big blind? Big blind folds back to me. I feel like this is a three better fold. Um, if we call here, we're not going to have position because the button's uh, I'm just going to call along. Um, I kind of I like making it like 200 or something, trying to secure position. And if the small blind, oh God, man, if you make it that big, he's kind of going to go with it. And so, yeah. I think four bet folding is pretty terrible. Yeah. You know, personally. I mean, cause we, we don't, we don't know the villain. Yeah. He's, he might be capable of, you know, effort shoving his pocket sevens where we're, we're folding would just be horribly. Yes. Yeah, it would just be bad. Um, I, and the fact the button is somebody who's never going to squeeze here and he's going to play pretty face up post flop. So I kind of look at his calling here. We do have position because we got a position on the guy's raising here. Okay. So I'm not really too concerned. Um, and his price, his raise is pretty small. Yeah. Yeah. So if he makes it a hundred, I fold 80. I think I scratch my head for a second and 60 because he makes it small. We can maybe four bet fold there, but make it to make it to go from 60 to 200 would be terrible. And then fold in my opinion, like if, if yeah, I, would, we can't do that. If I was going to raise fold, I would go 60. I would go to make it one, 145 or something like that. And either fold or we now have the betting lead in position on this guy. If he just decides to call our four bet, I think, I think calling is the clearly the choice here personally, but um, I, I was actually going to err on the side of caution and, and say a fold. Um, but I, I just, I don't like uh, playing out of position to the button on this one. And um, it's probably kind of tight, but uh, I think I would let this go. But, it, it, you've played with the button quite a bit. You say he's tight. He's um, was it? Was he's it never, like he, when he, he called, he's he never, just he's never down squeaked. and and then he just quickly flicked in a call, or was there any thought? Was it just kind of like he looked and he's like, oh, I have pocket threes. I might hit a set. I call like what? Um, I yeah, I don't, uh, I don't, re I don't remember that information. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So he's you, never, uh, he's never, he's almost, he's never ever zero percent of the time back raising here. That much oh, I know. Okay. Well, that raises, he raises his value hands on the button against me okay. every time. Okay. Jack's plus is a raise. I know where I'm at. Against him, I fold. Okay. Right. I mean, well, I, 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 I fold ace, I, I fold ace queen off. I call probably with 10 seven suited okay. because I can, you know what I mean? I can, yeah, you can stack them. Um, I call button calls. Okay. So, so we got uh, 60, 60, 180, 185 in the pot? 185 in the pot. Okay. The flop is a jack three deuce rainbow. Jack three deuce rainbow. Okay. Hmm. All right. Small blind? Small blind checks. And it's on us. Do you bet and try to take it down here and hope he has a pair below a jack or an ace? Into 185. So tell, so what, what you've said about the button, if he's got tens or below here, he's probably just folding if you leave, if you lead out, right? Especially with the small blind behind him. Uh, he might call once with... Eights through tens. I don't know. Okay. Yeah, I, I don't mind the lead here. Um, there's uh, any face card or ten is good for us. Um, well, there's a hundred. There's one hundred eighty-five dollars in the pot. We'd like to exactly. You know, so. Yeah, uh, I'd probably go somewhere between ninety and one ten, something like that. Um, I bet eighty. Maybe okay. that's too small. I don't know um, how that will interpret, but a lot of times uh, if they think, well, I'm betting small, I'm going to call with pocket sixes, then I'm going to be barreling turn big a lot of times. So putting their, their stacks, their stack is at play. Even when I bet small here, the guy, the button realizes that for sure, which yeah. is still, he, so he still might be folding pocket tens here. I don't know. He's probably three betting pocket tens, but he's, he's very, very snug. Okay. Um, 
I bet 30 anyways. The button. Or you bet 80, right? I bet 80, sorry. The button folds and the small blind calls. Okay, small blind calls 80. Okay, so now we've got um, 345. Okay. How do we, now how do we range the small blind? Let's let's just say he's um, on the, uh, you know, your average 2-5 villain. I don't know how to, how to say it. He's usually, um, he's three betting is, is usually value heavy, but um, probably some bluffs. And I don't think he's quickly, I don't think he's floating very often here to, to bluff the turn or anything. Yeah, he's probably got some, he's probably got at least a pair. Um, or ace king or ace king um i mean for some reason if he three bet ace five or four you know some sort of uh, gutter ball or straight draw four or five suited um i would think um uh, like eights plus um ace king uh and then some hand with the jack like if he decided to uh, three bet queen jack of hearts or something or ace jack or um, wouldn't he? Wouldn't he see bet most mostly with that hand? Maybe. I don't know. He both called. If he's got something like uh, you know queen jack suited, then yeah, maybe you're right. Maybe he is see betting that um, being out of position for the hand might be right. Well, what, what would you range him? Yeah, like you said, um, middle pairs. I thought was the most logical choice now he could have a set too we gotta we gotta True. mention that he could have jacks yeah yeah um, i don't think he has twos or threes with no flush draw out there um i think it's uh he's probably i mean he, he might see bet or check raise or check call check call probably earns him the most money if for some reason he has top set here yeah i think yeah long term if we wanted to run 7 million simulations, I think that would be the most profitable way to play a set there. Yeah. I yeah. So. Deuces and threes, people usually aren't raising, but you never know. I mean, people just, the, the, the casual players at two, five see things differently. You know what I mean? I think raising two, three there, uh, pre-flop would be a horrible play to, uh, to three bet that, but right. I, I, but doesn't mean he doesn't do it. Doesn't mean he doesn't do it. Yeah. Um, but, uh, I'm pretty much removing that. Um, I think you could be right. Maybe he's calling there with like uh, ace four, ace five, um, you know, suited, and he might have a backdoor flush and a gutter ball and, you know, an ace over. Um, but I think the vast majority of his, the time he's going to have like sevens, eights, nines, tens, ace king, and then like a, uh, a jack. Right. Um so he he calls, and the turn is a seven of diamonds. Okay. So jack, seven, three, deuce. Okay. And small blind checks? Small blind checks. Okay, and it's on us again. Into 345. How much does everyone have behind? He's got like 450 behind, something like that. Hmm. Do we go twice here? I don't know. I was thinking when we bet this, if we get called, unless we get a 10 king, queen, or ace on the turn, then we, we check behind and take our free card. But I feel like, you know, the if he had uh, eights, nines, or tens here, we could probably take it down with a turn bet. Right. If we're repping Jack X, then um, there'd be no reason to slow down here. True. If we had Ace Jack, we'd probably be betting again, right? Yeah. Unless we're worried, unless it was depending if we thought it was a really clever villain who might be playing an over pair, trying to let us blast off this way. Yeah. But um, if we're putting him on middle pair, heavy range here, um, and I think we probably, maybe we can even bet fold here if we had, uh, I mean, obviously with ace queen, we can. Yeah. 
if for some reason we had, a, you know, a smaller jack, jack 10 or something, um, we probably could bet fold here. I don't know. I, I think, though, on this turn, if he's got, like, queens, kings, or aces, uh, which we blocked two of those, um, I think he's leading turn. So, I don't know. His hand just looks a lot like uh, eights, nines, tens, or jack. Yeah, I, if he's going to check flop, I would. I don't know why. If he's if if his read on me is that I'm aggressive and and I, I blast away and try to steal pots, which is would be a pretty good read. Then, <laughs> which is pretty accurate. <laughs> then uh, it, why not just check aces again here and let me bet bet again with my with my with my jack or with um my air. Yeah, oh, that's an interesting point. Yeah. So yeah, you he leads here, then all my bluffs just get folded. Yeah. Okay. Good point. Yeah. Uh, maybe maybe lead with this um, lead small with a set here just to confound the villain I guess you know what I mean yeah um, I'd go either way on this I could take a free card or I could uh, well let's put it this way if you check back what is your your river plan what, what depending on what he does uh, if I check behind uh, I think I'm looking to hit a uh, ace or a queen. Um, a jack would. I mean, there's uh, already there's over three hundred dollars in the pot. We um, obviously it was not a value bet on the uh, on the flop. I don't think it was to get us a free turn card either to get to showdown. I mean, we're trying to trying to win it. Our 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 read on the, when he calls the flop is that he's he's pretty weak. He's got a marginal hand, right? Yeah, yeah. So I think we're out, rather than just trying to catch, I think we're obligated probably to. I. But yeah, the, I the conventional so. wisdom with the bluffers, and I mean, I'm trying to think what Mark would say here. He might be kind of in give up mode, depending. He might be like, I'm only barreling, like you said, when I pick up equity. Yeah. Um, in a deep stack cash game, I think that's the problem here with the two five a little bit. Our stack depth. Yeah. Because if I bet here and he calls. He's pretty much got to call the river. I mean, maybe he doesn't. If I bet 165 here um, and he calls, there's now almost 700 in the pot and he's got like 250 left in his stack. Yeah, yeah. So in a in a deep, st in a 5-5, five, five, where we start with 300 big blinds, I can, I can bomb the turn and he's still, you know, he still is a much harder decision to make on the river here. Yeah, you got some fold equity uh, on, the, on the end. But here we're like a little more than a hundred big blinds deep. It, uh, so it's probably, um, I don't know. Is it either go three streets and set up the shove or just like you said, just check and kind of give up and hope, hope somehow we're good. So hope he's got ace tens. I mean, I don't know. We shouldn't be good when he calls the flop. Um, I don't think so. I think no. he's almost always has a pair there or unless he's, he's got, I don't know, queen king with the back door flush draw or something. I mean, I, I don't know, but, um, I, I that, here I just don't know what the right play is, Steve. I, I my instinct tells me against again if it, if especially if he was I don't remember specifically if he was feeling uh, uneasy th this is where the Barton reads might help. Yeah, then it's a, if, then if he it's just snap bit. called the flop like through the chips in like yeah go ahead asshole try to try to get me to fold. <laughs> um. I'd be less likely to barrel turn where if it was like you could tell he was a, he was like kind of anxious about it or didn't like the flop. Then I think barrel more likely to barrel here. Yeah. Yeah. I feel, I feel like eights, nines and tens are, are a must call for him. And he's kind of like, ah, please don't bet the turn. You know, one of those It. um, I don't know. And this is stuff that I don't know matters, but you know, I don't remember the quality of the table here, but there might be like, well, I only got 140 bucks in. I don't want to give away a stack. It's a good game kind of thing. Why get in such a high variant spot? But I decided to check back the turn. Okay. Um, following your advice, I guess maybe, yeah, I don't remember my, but if you're going to check back the turn, um, barreling any big cards or bluffing any big cards in the river, I guess, sort of makes sense. Yeah. To a good player, it probably doesn't. Um, maybe not. I don't know. Well, Ace would. 
Um, so the river is another Jack. Hmm. Yeah, that's not a very good card. What what small blind do? Do he check? He checks. Yeah. See, I don't think he's folding eights, nines, or tens now. Um, I was hoping you're going to say the river was a king. <laughs> it's a must bet. Um, yeah. So there's three four. There's three forty something in the pot, and this guy has four forty in his stack. I mean, may, maybe we just put them all in here and let's see that. God, if you put them all in, is he folding eights, nines, or tens? As your, your hand looks exactly like what it is. It's either a complete bluff or you have a jack um, or like queens, kings, or aces. But I don't think you're checking queens, kings, or aces on the turn. I'm probably just giving up. I mean, that's a terrible river. <laughs> it, uh, um, if we were to try, I mean, would a smaller, smallish bluff work so we don't have to put our whole kind of step, we don't have to do an out, put a lot of money in, but like. Maybe like 110 or 150 or 110 something. 110 just to get him to fold ace king, I guess. I don't know. But if he's never folding any pairs, then that's a bad bet. I think so, because he doesn't have. I mean, well, how many combos are there of eights, nines, and tens? I guess there's. Uh, um, what is that for you? You're breaking 12. up again there, Steve. No, um, I'm sorry. I'm mumbling to myself. Um, well, ace king would make sense. Eights, nines, and tens would make sense, and a jack would make sense, although it's less likely because one came on the river. Um, yeah, I think I'm just giving up. It, it would suck to lose to ace-king here, but I think he's got a lot more of the other hands in his range than he does ace-king. So, yeah, I think I'm checking. Um, I think that's probably the play. Um, I decided to shove. Okay. Um, I thought I was sticking with our read middle, middle pair. And even though he's supposed to call there, I think it's a really tough spot for him. Yeah. Um, I, I thought if I bet 200 here, he, he makes a pretty easy call, but you know, that all in thing is pretty, pretty powerful. Yeah. People like having strong hands when they're all in. Um, now, against, like I said, my, my shoving just doesn't make any sense. Well, for someone, who's, yeah, for someone yeah. who's really for someone who's really breaking it down, I guess sometimes if I had a jack on the flop, I would check back turn, just hoping he's not trapping me with the aces kind of thing. But um, almost any value hand on the flop, I'm uh, I'm betting on the turn, trying to set up a getting our stacks in. Um. He was he get, he had an anguished fold. He took a while. Okay. So he did have a pair. Um, I think I that's kind of I just thought it was a, kind of an interesting hand. Just in that I didn't have any real confidence in any street at all. <laughs> what <laughs> what the proper play is? Well, I, I I think pre was a pretty clear call. You you like fold or raise? I think fold wouldn't be terrible. I think raise is, was not the play there, but um, I think you're right. I think pre raise is bad just because of the stack size and the depth. You know, if it was uh, if you were 300 big blinds deep, like you would be at five five. I think a three bets pretty cool, um, but you know, with 120 bigs or whatever this is, um, uh, yeah. I, I, in game, I would fold, but you've kind of uh, convinced me that maybe a call there is best. The river show, I don't know. Alex really didn't like it. He says it's terrible. Doesn't make any sense. Okay. He'd be snapping me off there with Ace King. Wow. Um, I don't know if he actually said that, but you know, yeah. I mean, it's it just it, it, there's so many there's so many more bluffs than than value hands. If I have a jack, first of all, why would I be shoving? Uh, don't I want to get paid? Yeah. Um, I haven't really discussed so. Um, this is just trying to get someone. I mean, I don't know. Maybe I had more reads on the guy than um, 
like he, I just sensed he just was really hoping I'd check the river or, you know, that he was weak. I'd, I'd seen him make an, ex, made an exploitive fold earlier. So, uh, this was kind of just beyond analysis. I think, uh, I probably from any theoretical stance played the hand poorly. What, what, what did Alex say about your call preflop? Did he like the call preflop or? Um, let me see if I have some notes on that. Uh, he likes pre and flop. He likes me taking a shot on the flop. Okay. And sizing up and, the flop wasn't um, too small? No, he didn't say anything about hmm. that. Okay. And what, what do you, what do you mention about the turn? Did he say the turn was a bit? Uh, turn is a bet. If there's an undercard to the Jack, yes, I'm repping a Jack. I have to bet it again. And we, okay. if we think he's capped. So, um, yeah, I can bet turn and shove river, but if I check back flop, it's uh, a turn, I guess it's a check on the river. Okay. So that's all kind of makes sense. Yeah. 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 Huh. Interesting. Well, that was cool. That's all I got, Stevie. I, mean, right I, I do have some more hands if I wanted to dig through them here, but I, I don't, uh, I didn't look at them ahead of time, so I don't know. That's all good. We can, uh, we can wrap it up. I do want to throw a uh, thank you out to all the listeners. Um, it, uh, I do a scholarship every year for the high school that I used to uh, go to. And for the last few years, what I've done is I've taken all the profits from the podcast. Um, and, uh, I've, turn it into a scholarship. And so far this year, we've gotten uh, uh, about $2,100 in, uh, in profits since the last year. And so I'm doing a scholarship uh, for two grand. And I'll run the extra hundred bucks over for the next year. And so I just want to thank you guys for, you know, using our Amazon link for getting your Elliott Row MP3s, joining 6-4 Spades, joining TPE and all that. It uh, It's pretty cool. It um, I'm going to pick up the... Uh, the submissions uh, today, the essays that they wrote for the scholarship, and uh, then I'll pick a winner by tonight. So thank you guys for doing that. It's going to a good cause, and uh, I appreciate it, and so does the student every year that, that gets the uh, scholarship. So thank you guys. You can go to headsuppoker.poker and click on our links through there and, and uh, bookmark us on Amazon and, and all that. So thank you. But uh, that's all I got for this week, Mikey, unless you uh, want to throw something else in. That's it, Steve. Right on. Nice to, uh, nice to talk to you again. Yeah, it was good getting on here and, uh, and talking poker. This was, uh, this was fun. I'm looking forward to getting back into it. I've been on a six-week hiatus, but uh, I can't wait to start playing again. So thank you for tuning in. And here is your weekly motivation. I want you to know when you dream your dream that there are other people who are dreaming the exact same dream. When you said to yourself, when the ball comes down, this is what I want to accomplish. You're not the only person that wants to accomplish it. And now I ask you this question. What do you do when a thousand other people want exactly what you want? What do you do when you're not the only one that wants to make a million dollars in your company? You're not the only one that wants to be a CEO. What if you're not the only one that wants what you want? What if there are thousands of other people who want what you want? You have to outwork them. You gotta outgrind them. You gotta get up earlier. You gotta stay up later. You've gotta execute and you've gotta go from 70 to 120. I wish I could tell you 70% is enough. But it's not going to happen. So I need you to understand something. You can have it if you want it. But the bigger the dream, the harder the grind.